In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Today we have a very, very, very special gospel. This gospel is so full of so many deep meanings and challenges and things to inspire and things to, to convict. When you look at the story of the rich young ruler, at the end of the story we know that he leaves sad, Christ asks something of him, he goes away sad, and we always think he's kind of a failure. But when you think of the question that he asked, he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he calls Christ good teacher. You have to understand at that time to call Christ a good teacher. When he was, Christ was hated, he was scorned by so many of the leaders of Israel. And here this rich young ruler comes to Christ and says, good teacher, good teacher, just tell me what I have to do to enter into to eternal life. He was sincere. He came, he knelt, he didn't care about what people think, thought, and he came before Christ and says, good teacher, just tell me what I got to do to inherit eternal life. His question though, though sincere, and though with pure intentions, it gives us a little bit of insight into his maturity. He probably didn't understand what he was asking. When he said, first of all, good teacher, he had a very, un, like a very shallow understanding of what is good. And I think nowadays, in the church, not church with a big C, but the current church, we find that often what is considered good is a very shallow understanding of goodness. And so Christ is quick to respond and say, be careful. Why do you call me good? Just because you see me do some good deeds? Just because you see me helping the poor and preaching? Is this why you're calling me good? He says, be careful. Because the word good is only given to God. And Christ isn't saying that I'm not good so don't call me God or don't call me good because I'm not God. No, He's saying if you really understand the meaning of good and who it is that you're calling good and that good is only ascribed to God then you have to understand the deep meaning of that. And because of this He's basically saying to Christ just point out some good deeds that I have to do Tell me what to do and I'm willing to do it. You want me to go help that guy? I'll help that guy. You want me to go give some money? I'll give some money. You want me to give some time? I'll give some time. And Christ wants to address his shallow understanding of what is goodness. And I pray that maybe he can address it to us right now. You see, the rich young ruler is thinking about our external deeds. And if I were to ask you, what is goodness? You say it's helping the poor, it's uh, coming to church, it's reading your Bible, it's praying. And then Christ says, obey the commandments. And he says, I've done these all from my youth. For any Jew at the time, when Christ tells him, obey all the commandments, like no one can obey all the commandments. The commandments were so difficult, they were so like precise and they were so challenging and they were very like not anyone could fulfill the whole law because if you messed up on one part of the commandments that's it you're guilty of the whole law so he says obey the commandments and he says I've done these from my youth I wonder today if I were to ask you describe to me the spiritual life describe to me the spiritual life what does it consist of you say Buddha, some prayers reading the Bible, coming to church, taking communion, confessing once a month, giving to the poor, being nice to people. It's, it's simple. The spiritual life is simple. And sometimes people, they complicate it, but the spiritual life is simple. But what does Christ say? We're going to get to that. But Christ says, you obeyed the commandments? Okay. Since you're perfect in the commandments, and you have a shallow understanding of what it means to fulfill the commandments, I'm going to just open your, your eyes a little bit to the real commandments. Because anyone that has fulfilled all the commandments, of course, 
can do anything that I ask. Any small deed that I put at your feet should be easy. He says, okay. Go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word and went away grieved for he had great possessions. You see, Christ wants to say, to fulfill all the commandments, you can't do it by yourself. You cannot do it by yourself. It doesn't just come by doing a few things, the checklist, and maybe the few things that the church points out for us, and that's it. Because look, we're in the season of grace now, right? In the New Testament, we're in the season of grace. So of course Christ doesn't want us to obey all the commandments. I do a few of them here and a few of them there, and I'm good at them. And I have mistakes, but who doesn't have mistakes? But because we're in the season or the era of grace... Christ will understand. He's a nice guy. Jesus is so sweet, he'll look over them. We have to be careful. We have to be careful at what our understanding of the commandments is. Because even Christ says, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. The commandments are still taken as a whole. You say, what about God's grace? Where does that come in? I pray that today maybe God will, will clarify what that means. If you were to truly go and examine the things, the commandments, that are truly in your hearts, if this guy would have done that, maybe he wouldn't have said, I've done these all from the youth. Maybe he'd say, I think I've broken all of them. When it comes to murder, murder doesn't just mean killing someone, but Christ tells us murder is if you have anger in your heart towards someone. Adultery isn't physical adultery only, but it's having an impure thought about someone. You've committed adultery in your heart. Stealing. There are so many things that are engulfed in the commandments that it's not just the big headline of don't steal, I haven't robbed a bank, I don't rob stores. But I do take from the back room at work, I take the paper clips and I take the pens and I take the paper. We all do that. I'm sorry, I even do it here. It's wrong. It's wrong. But we have to understand that the commandments are given to us in all meanings of the commandments. They're supposed to be taken even to the heart. Even to the heart. Christ saw his fault. But even though he still looked at him with compassion, he said, I don't want you to look at how you behave with your own flashlight. Look at it with God's light. Take God's candle. Go into your heart and explore. Dig deep. Am I really obeying the commandments? And so that's what Christ wanted to hear from this rich young ruler. When he says, obey the commandments, he wanted him to come down and say, Lord, who can obey the commandments? I need help. I need grace. These commandments are too hard. Christ could have said, well, now that I'm here, don't worry about the commandments. I'm going to forgive you anyways. No. What does he say? He takes one thing, the thing that was in his heart, and he says, you have a lot of possessions, go, sell all that you have, give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. You really want heaven? You want eternal life? Okay, I have the solution. Go sell to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. He chose his love of money. He chose his love of money. And for each one of us, Christ would pose a different question. It's not money, it's the love of money. A few days ago, we gathered the church together in, in the church, and we presented kind of the, the situation that we're in as a church, financially and administratively, and we're going through a challenge. We posed some numbers, we, we presented some numbers, and we said, we have 1,200 households in the church, 1,200 households, and we have 400 donors, so 30% of the people are tithing. Of the 400 donors, a third of those people are donating less than $50 a month. So today, maybe Christ's commandment to us is the same commandment, your money, the love of money. And I don't mean, Abuna, I tithe, like, get over it. I tithe, I give you your money, leave me alone. Maybe you're the person that tithes. But Christ didn't say to this man, go tithe. 
Go give me 10%. What did he say? Go, give all you have, give to the poor. This was a hard question. Not an easy thing to ask. And so he's trying to present to him the difficulty of the commandments. But it says Christ looked at him with love. He looks at us and he says, I want to help you. I want to give you the ability to fulfill the commandments. I want to give you the grace and the power to obey all of the commandments. And I want you to believe that you can do it, but you cannot do it on your own. It's a big request that Christ made. And he tried to make it very clear that it is a very big request and that there's no way he's going to be able to do it to show, look man, you need me. You need to tie yourself to me. When it comes to sin, we all have sin. We all have darkness in our life. Sometimes we go, we come before God, we come before Abuna, we confess the sin. And maybe Abuna says, you know, you say I'm angry. And Abuna says, okay, don't be angry. I know, I, like, I wish I could do that, but I have a problem. Which is why the church has given us the secret in the Eucharist. The Eucharist is life. You cannot just take darkness into a bucket and empty it out. You can't. You have to bring light into the darkness. You have to bring life into the place where there is death. And that's what we need. Christ has given us life through His flesh and through His blood. And we believe that in His mysteries, we will have life. In Him we have life. So in order to cast out the death, you can't just tell the death to leave. You can't try and look at the death hard enough and focus on it enough that it's going to leave you have to attach yourself to life. The secret is attaching yourself to life. And he's saying, I need you to cling. I need you to ask. I need you to understand that I want to give. If you're united to me, you'll fulfill the commandments. Well, how can I be united? You struggle. You give time for prayer. You give time for devotion. You give time for fasting. You give time in the Word of God. And believe me, you commit to the Eucharist. You commit to uniting yourself to Him. Or let him unite himself to you. And you'll have life. You will have grace, which is why St. Peter told us in today's epistle, he says it very clearly. As his divine power has given us, given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, he has given us the ability to become godly. More than that, he takes it even further. He says what? We have become partakers. He says what? That through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. Good, I need the divine nature because my human nature stinks. It's corrupt. It's sinful. It's weak. I need to be united to the divine nature. So that Him in me can make me like Him. Him in me can make me like Him. When it comes to money, when I lived in Africa, I had some very rare experiences and I understood what it means of somebody who really gives all they have to God. I remember we went to go visit a young woman. We were missionaries at the time. I wasn't a priest. And she asked us to visit her home. She says, I live a bit far, so let me come to you. I'll pick you up. So she walked four kilometers to, to the church to pick us up. Then she took us to her house four kilometers. And then when we were there, this is walking, by the way. Then we were there. We look around. I tell the servants, like, she has nothing in her house. She doesn't have a bed. She has a, like a big pot, a pitcher, and peanuts. And so she takes the thing of peanuts and gives it to all of us. And I asked, I'm like, is there anything else in the house? Do they have anything? So I told some of the servants, let's get some money, and we'll give her a blessing. We'll give her some, some money. And she gives us all of her peanuts. And we say, what are you doing? We're coming to give, to give to you. She says, no, you're the people of God. I need to give to you. We said, no, 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 no. We want to help you. We want to give you some money to help you and support you. She says, no way. You don't give me. I give you. You represent God. You're the servants of God. I need to give to you. But you don't have anything. You don't have anything. No, but that was her heart. Is that she wanted to give everything. She wanted to give all of it, even though it was just peanuts. It wasn't going to satisfy us. 
We weren't going to be filled by the peanuts. We were going to leave hungry. God is not going to be filled by your peanuts. But you have to give it to Him with your heart. You have to give Him your peanuts. You have to give Him all that you have. And say, this is all I have. This woman is a woman that lives by faith. Another family, we visited, we were serving one parish, and one of the couples, they were the poorest of the poor. Everybody in the church was very poor. This was the poorest, because they didn't have any land to farm. And the couple, none of them had jobs. So we went to go visit them, and they wanted to honor us, so they gave us one soda, which is 40 shillings, which is exactly 50 cents. It takes one full day of work to make a dollar, one full day of work in the farm slaving to make a dollar. They wanted to give us a soda. They couldn't give each of us a soda, so they gave us one bottle of soda. Because they wanted to honor my wife, they gave her a cup, and they poured the soda halfway into the cup, and they gave it to her. As we're sitting down, Sherry looks at me. She's like, I can't drink this. I said, why? What's wrong? They're giving us everything. She said, look inside the cup. I look inside the cup. It's covered with mud on the bottom of the cup. I'm like, we have to drink this stuff. This is going to be an insult to the people. So as soon as like, the kids were making noise outside of the hut, the parents ran outside to go see what was going on. We switched. I downed the soda, and then I gave it back to her. And then, but I realized that this is somebody who wants to give us everything. They want to give us what they can give us. They have no money. They have no job, but they want to give. And yet we, because we love our possessions, we can't give. Or we give, ah, it's tough times these days. Right? It's tough times. There's no kid in our church that doesn't have video games. There's no kid that doesn't have an iPod or a phone. Or, like, we have things for other stuff. We need to give our hearts. And God is saying, look, I understand it's difficult. I've given you my Holy Spirit to live in you to sanctify you, to give you power, to give you the ability to live a miracle and to obey the commandments. And when you struggle, there's repentance to start fresh. Start fresh to focus again to fulfill all the commandments. Then Christ says, then the disciples say, well then who can be saved? Like you just asked this guy, the hardest thing in the world, who can be saved? Christ says what? With men it is impossible. With men it is impossible. When I ask you to describe the spiritual life, do you ever say, Abuna, it's impossible? You say, Abuna, it's easy. We pray some prayers. We pray before we eat. We read the Bible. We fast. We give to the poor. We do some things. Spiritual life is easy. Christ himself says, he tells his disciples, you know, I have bad news for you. With men, it's impossible. You can't do it. But with God, not God alone, and not me alone, with God, that we are co-workers with God in this effort. That, Lord, I want to give you, I need your grace. I need your grace to work in me. With God, all things are possible. All things. You can become like the saints that you see, which is why in the liturgy, we say the holies are for the holy. And we say, we can't do this. We are not worthy to partake of your body and your blood. Christ says, look, struggle. And you have examples. You have the saints who have become like me. That's why the priest says the commemoration to say, they're your examples. No excuses. They can do it. I've given them my spirit. I've given you my spirit. You can do it. I believe in you. Your potential is Christ. Not to be good like this person thought to do some good deeds. Your potential, your goal is Christ. To be like Christ. And He is both willing and doing inside of you according to His purpose. In Philippians chapter 2, He's telling us, I'm going to work in you. Trust, but cling. Cling to me. Surrender. The commandments are big. It's a big task. But believe and struggle and say, what can I do to inherit eternal life? Is that our goal? What can I do? But Abuna, I have the worst sins and I keep falling in the same thing. I believe in you. Christ believes in you and Christ believes that when you let Him in, and you continue to cling and cling and cling, when you become united to Christ, you will fulfill the commandments. Because we can't say because we're in the season of grace, I got 3 out of 10, or 7 out of 10. He's putting all the commandments before us, and He's saying, cling to me, surrender. He painted a big picture before Him to say, look, you have a misunderstanding of the commandments. It is a big thing. So us coming saying, I attended the sermon on Sunday, and I took communion. And I confessed it two, two months ago. And I gave tithes 
two years ago. And I did Marav Sha'i. All these things that we do, ah, that's not the commandments. That's one tittle of the commandment. It's nothing. We need Him to live in us and to live through us and to make us like Him. I pray that today you cling to life. You put your eyes, you fix your eyes on the Eucharist and you say, I need life. Too much darkness, too much sin, too much weakness. I need strength, I need life, I need power, I need Christ, I need Him. Devour Him, eat Him, eat Him with His body, with His, with his divinity and His humanity united together. Eat Him and partake of Him and be united to Him. And glory be to God forever. Amen.